Antaran Ki Ramacharaka. In this video, I will read chapter one from L.W. De Lawrence's book called The Master Key, first published in 1914. The Master Key is a book of practical instruction in the development of concentration, attention control, and the cultivation of the power of will to achieve those first two. Chapter one is a bit of just introductory material. It is called Mental Equilibrium. I'm narrating it to you because I don't see it done anywhere, anywhere else here on YouTube. <clears throat> and because some people are interested in uh, getting introduced to the idea of mental discipline training for themselves. And also because a few people recently, actually in my life, have said things to me that that invoked a response from me, the response being, well, perhaps you should look into um, maybe some training in mental discipline or, or control over your attention. These were people who had attention deficit, deficit problems. <clears throat> Excuse me. And their response to me was, back to me was, what? Why would I want to control my thoughts? Why would I want to, why would I do that? I don't, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want my mind to be under control. Even if it's by me, I, I want my mind to be free. What are you talking about? That's ridiculous. And so, I don't think they got the point. I'm not, I'm not sure why they responded that way. <clears throat> but um, I think that they feel that they're a little bit misled about what mental, uh, mental discipline is, is really about and, and how it will help them in life. So, this is kind of for people who have that reply to People who feel like uh, learning to control your own mind is an error. This is kind of a response to that. Thought, our manner of thinking and self-control, or mental discipline, are important factors in life's achievements. On these depend our power of concentration and the mental equilibrium that must be maintained by those who wish to advance. It lies within the earnest student to create a world of thought wherein he may weather the calm, with calm fortitude the storms of mental life. For disappointment and sorrow pass no one by, and suffering is the loom in which character is made. Mind can be so powerful a defensive arm in the battle of earthly existence that in behalf of his interests and welfare the student should learn to measure its force, understand its almost limitless power, and educate himself to employ it judiciously. The student must learn to appreciate, at its true value, this force, given to him that he may be able to meet and conquer not only exterior difficulties, but even greater and more subtle enemies from within. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thought is a product of the mind, a mental vibration, and therefore a force which penetrates even into the physical body and worldly affairs of mankind. It is thought that slowly and unerringly builds up or tears down the whole moral fabric of our being. Consciously or unconsciously, it acts upon everyone with whom you have near or remote contact. The great discoveries of science, the mechanical inventions, the masterpieces in music and art, all of these being achievements due to the patient and tireless efforts of the intellect are but the results of concentrated thought. If your thinking is inspired by high ideals, nourished by the practice of virtue and honesty, and is submissive to a will that sincerely directs it to its highest end, it will achieve moral, intellectual, and even material results of a positive character, as surely as sound seed planted in good soil will blossom and bear fruit following the natural law of its growth. Through the same certain process do evil results follow upon evil and sordid lines of thought. And hence the employment of this faculty for unworthy ends in any circumstances is a disintegrating action, morally disastrous to the individual, even though the material or intellectual aim has been accomplished. Thought is a creative force, a fact that the student must always bear in mind. Every thought, be it good or evil, creates corresponding conditions. There is, however, a species of mental activity, if I may call it activity at all, 
which is akin to the flapping of canvas on the ill-trimmed sails of a sea vessel. It, o it occupies some to the extent that they fancy that they are thinking, but in reality they are floating aimlessly on the tide. Unless thought be employed for a specific accomplishment, and guided and controlled by the will, it follows the line of least resistance and spends itself in idle dreaming. This dissipation of a great force weakens our mental and moral and even our physical faculties. It is in no wise different from the atrophy that follows upon non-use of our muscles in the work for which they were designed. If we can say that any faculty of the human compound is more important than the faculty of thought, well, that one must be the will. It is the, it is the divine part of man. Our most elementary concept of a successful man or woman is the concept of a, compel, of a compelling force, a great urging toward a result, and this is will. And every one of us possesses in a greater or less degree this faculty as an essential constituent of our individuality. If we are to seek peace and moral strength in the highways of achievement, the will must focus on worthy aims. Our end must be work well done, rather than selfish advancement for its own sake. When the human will is directed by truth, honesty, and confidence, man is guided and directed by an unerring vision of right. And even though failure should await his efforts, his whole moral nature has been strengthened by disinterested endeavor, and the way is prepared for some greater achievement with more telling results. Reason is the mentor of will, and thoughts are its workmen. Reason plans the spiritual or material edifice, the will is the foreman who controls and directs, keeping order and industry in the ranks of the workmen until the structure is complete. Thoughts, in other words, must be absolutely controlled by the will and directed by it into proper channels. With the larger part of humanity, thoughts, like wayward, spoiled children, run hither and thither, seeking distraction and fair fields where no mental effort is required. The moment concentration is demanded, and this is speaking generally, they rebel, scamper off, and only a firm will can bring them back. But first they sulk. The mind remains inactive, and all that has been gained apparently is a restless obedience on their part and a certain moral and mental strength, the result of persistent effort. But as thought was created subject to will, repeated and persistent effort on the part of this faculty reduces thought to docile and absolute obedience. And when you accomplish this, anarchy has been uprooted in the mental kingdom. A sensation of peace and of strength is experienced in the re-establishment of order under the reign of reason and will. Infinite patience and untiring perseverance are important factors in the accomplishment of this result. The student of psychology and mental discipline must have no illusions concerning the arduous task that lies before him, and he must bring to it not only courage and the determination to, and the determination to conquer, but a vigilance that never sleeps. Few of today sufficiently realize the power of a thought, its danger, and its creative potency. The minds of average human beings run riot. The majority of people, even in this era of psychology and mental culture, take little thought of what and how they think. Actions are regarded to be the prime objects of consideration, in their relation to the established order of things. They are learning only now that if they would influence their actions with unquestioned certainty, they must cultivate the field in which their actions spring up and grow into actualities. And this field is the field of thought. Many believe that because their thoughts are their own and unknown to others, they imagine that they can harbor all sorts of unworthy sentiments and feelings so long as they do not actually allow these feelings to betray themselves in corresponding actions. They do not realize that every bad mental habit indulged in against precept of perfection not only inclines them to the act, but it lowers the ideal, and it weakens their moral 
their moral nature, and their power of resistance. The Catholic Church recognizes how effective thought is in producing conditions, insofar as the Catholic Church requires her children to confess their sins of thought and imposes penance for any deliberate evil intention, even though the act was never committed. It follows, then, that our true worth or, worthy, or unworthiness lies in our manner of thinking, no matter how seemingly just or unjust we may appear outwardly. In the fortress of the mind alone is peace or unrest to be found. And it is, and, and in this, the immutable law of compensation is made manifest. The man who possesses all that life has to offer, who seems calm, prosperous, and upon whom fate apparently smiles, may be in a tumult of interior unrest and dissatisfaction. His outer life appears well-ordered, while inwardly is unforgiving, <clears throat> grasping, and self-seeking. Excuse me. The apparently unfortunate being, on the contrary, who is generous, honest, and disinterested in his thoughts, no matter how great may be his suffering, his privation, his unhappiness, possesses moral strength and clearness of vision, unknown to his prosperous brother. He has interior mental peace, which gives content even in suffering. His life is pure at its fountainhead, which is his world of thought. And this clear limpid stream runs through it in acceptance, resignation, and the uplifting that comes from perfect harmony between his thoughts and his actions. Into such a life the whole world can gaze. Thoughts are as important, and even more so, than words. Many are careful about what they say. Being fully alive to the disastrous or the beneficent consequences of speech. It is equally important, therefore, to realize that although, that although subtle and invisible in their efforts, thoughts are more potent than words. Words can be so empty, so feeble, while thought is always vital. We can say things we neither think nor mean, and such words carry no weight. But we must think things to feel them. Therefore, the results of wrong thinking are much more harmful to the individual than anything he can say. They also pass on to others, in that subtle emanation which we call moral atmosphere, as a strengthening or a disturbing, or a disturbing influence, sometimes vaguely felt, sometimes imperceptible, but at all times positively active. We must guard our thinking with the same circumspection that we apply to speech. And could we realize this fact, and think as discreetly as we choose our words, believing it to be of equal importance, we would greatly simplify the task of thought control. There would be fewer regrets and anxious moments in life. The realization of what thought can accomplish will bend our energies toward learning how to employ this force in order to attain the results they were meant to accomplish when properly controlled. The discipline of the mind is hard and painful work, but its conquest more than compensates for the mental stress and earnestness that it costs. Until mental control has restored order in the mind, the thoughts that one would deny entrance to struggle, clamor, and batter on the door of the mind. While the thoughts that reason, that right reason urges one to entertain strain at the leash, seeking freedom to run where they will and give place to the discordant, idle brood that claim their habitual abiding place. The peculiar feature of this chaotic mental condition is that thought only becomes refractory when commanded. When free to sweep across the mind at will and according to mood, its strength is not perceived. If your thoughts be gloomy, unkind, or bitter, the natural result is depression and bad temper. Should this mood persist, these discordant thoughts dwell peacefully and unmolested in the mind. Now here you have a vicious circle, 
indulgence in discord and thoughts producing the mood, an indulgence in the mood keeping the mind filled with these weakening and depressing thoughts. Never lose sight of the fact that what you fear, you attract. What you hope for and believe in, you create. For mind is magnetic and attracts to itself whatever it frequently thinks about. It is fatal ever to parley with a thought that one does not wish to entertain. Instantly it must be replaced by a concept good and encouraging. Should the mind be filled with fear and dread, usually unfounded, of some impending, um, of some impending danger, the picture should be reversed instantly, the mind forming an image of a happy, successful issue to the situation. Even should the trend of your thinking be strongly and persistently in an evil vein, its seeming strength is fictitious and yields before it the resolute act of the will. Now here I'm speaking not only of normal, but also of undisciplined minds. Those suffering from neurasthenia, a disease in which the will is attacked, have neither the mental nor the moral force to expel fixed ideas, which are one of the symptoms of the malady. These same neurasthenics, however, can be cured by being taught to watch and control their thoughts, practicing mental control for one minute at a time at first, until to, until to reassert its authority becomes a habit of the mind. How common it is to see people worrying about things that may never happen, mentally turning over situations that can be neither changed nor altered. This mental habit is demoralizing to both body and soul, for such indulgence begets irritability and unrest. It weakens the nerves by the strain this manner of thinking puts upon the whole nervous system. It is often necessary to entertain worrying, depressing, and sad thoughts. Every situation must be looked at bravely and squarely if you are to know what strength and resource you must bring to bear upon it. You entertain such thoughts deliberately with the object of solving the problem, and such thinking is a deliberate act of the will. The introspection is normal and wholesome and is accompanied by exterior activities directed to restoring happiness and peace of the mind. And when sorrow comes, and death robs us of our loved ones, it is human and natural to grieve. Nature demands, within measure, the outward, outward expression of grief, which relieves the burdened heart, or else sorrow eats within and undermines the whole being. But in this legitimate indulgence in grief, if, instead of turning over in our minds the why and wherefore of our bereavement, or of dwelling upon the void now in our lives, we strive manfully to fulfill the simple duties of our station in life, fixing the mind upon the task in hand, the mental and moral strength acquired through keeping the thoughts where the mind and hands are working, would give courage to bravely bear afflictions to bravely bear afflictions until time lays its healing hand upon our wounds. We have all known moments when we were besieged by worrying thoughts that we really did not wish to entertain. Reason told us that these thoughts were fruitless and depressing, and we knew full well that they were demoralizing both to character and well-being. Notwithstanding this fact, we allowed these thoughts to harass our minds dislodging them only temporarily and seeking some exterior distraction that enabled us to forget for the moment. This left them still master of the situation, for the distraction was but a weak surrender, not a firm and conquering act of will prompted by the realization that such thoughts were useless and harmful. The will is the sole, sure guardian of the mind. And when will acts in harmony, with reason, the mind is secure not only against these troublesome invaders, but is free to concentrate itself upon what is good, productive, and useful. Furthermore, our happiness and peace of mind would not then be at the mercy of thoughts we do not wish to entertain, 
and yet are powerless to banish completely. Each student can prove to his own satisfaction that once having accomplished thought control, intellectual and moral qualities and even material conditions can be created by persistently holding the thought of that which one wishes to achieve. By your manner of thinking, you can entirely change your feelings in regard to others, and even help others to correct the faults that created your resentful attitude towards them. As a student of concentration and mental discipline, you must not forget that good is positive and evil is negative. And evil, being negative in its nature, should not be dwelled upon. To correct grave faults of character or disposition, the mind must fix itself, not conspicuously upon uprooting these faults, but upon acquiring the opposite virtues. Should thoughts of bitterness and resentment for an injury done occupy the mind? It is not always possible to forgive the person simply because you believe it is Christian to do so. The mind inclines naturally to dwell upon the wrong done and the detestable character of the person who has done it. Each time these thoughts are indulged in, even though seemingly justifiable in the eyes of the injured party, hatred of the guilty person increases, and you see him only in, rela in his relation to yourself. All else in his life is ignored, however praiseworthy it may be. Nothing can bring about a change of heart save to resolutely dwell upon one or more of the good qualities of that person or the good actions he has done in his life. At first, the evil inherent in many people rebels at this lenient attitude of the mind, for their own evil tendencies grow and strengthen in thoughts of ill will. A hard battle must now be fought, for your wrongs seem to fill up the whole horizon. And the poor sinner's one redeeming quality appears but a trivial thing to consider. If these bitter and disturbing thoughts are instantly replaced by good thoughts each time they occur, be it one hundred times a day, one hundred times the moral nature has been strengthened, the mind is disciplined, and when the battle seems to last beyond your strength to endure, suddenly all resentment disappears giving place to feelings of pity and compassion toward your enemy. The mollification of your resentment at once relieves the tension in your moral nature. Peace abides within and you are free once more. For in yielding to evil sentiments, you become their slaves. Students of psychology can make it a habit to see only the good in people by refusing to dwell upon their faults however glaring they may be. If you are to accomplish this, it can, only be, it can be only by instantly turning the mind from the faults of your neighbor to the good qualities or virtues he may possess. A man who labors to see only what is good in others and remembers only the kind actions done to him, even though these kind actions may have been followed by much selfishness, neglect, and ingratitude, is a man who eliminates from his life all mental friction. This must be so because goodwill and indulgence towards the weaknesses of, other, weaknesses of others fills his heart to the exclusion of unkind feelings, and a consciousness of his own failings and a determination to correct them arrests the tendency to criticize and condemn the faults of his neighbor. This most desirable condition of soul can be brought about by our manner of thinking. And once we realize that the workings of the mind are according to psychological laws, we know that in learning these laws and in acting in harmony with them, we inevitably arrive at self-control, happiness, and interior peace, independent of place and condition. In order to bring these truths more uh, home more forcibly to himself, the student must first realize that thought is creative, and that by persevering in a certain manner of thinking he can not only create qualities, sentiments, and even conditions, but through thought he can also transform that which already exists. This being the case, distressing and morbid thoughts should never be indulged in, save when the situation that begot them must be studied with a view to its removal. Should there be no remedy for the evil, no exit from the unhappy mental state, then it is the height of folly to dwell upon it. 
Depressing, anxious thoughts are powerless to change a situation. They only vitiate one's mental, moral, and physical vitality. The mind must be turned to the few blessings, or perhaps the sole blessing one has. We must see only this blessing, and resist bravely the inclination to dwell upon the privations and the disappointments in our lives. In so doing, the natural result is entire acceptance of the unhappy condition. And once acceptance enters the heart, peace comes in to dwell within, comes with it to dwell within and to sweeten our lives. And sometimes, in after years, we see the wisdom of not having obtained that for which we had wept, and for which we uselessly had cast a shadow over our lives by our grief and repining. Well, this should teach us that a great unmutable power for right is behind our lives. Order, ordering them to the accomplishment of the highest good. This highest good is ever and always our own ultimate peace and happiness. The creative power of thought resides in every human being in like measure, and was given to man to aid him to attain his full development and consequent happiness. The degree to which it can be taken advantage of depends upon individual effort and a true faith in one's self. Our moral, intellectual, or material ideal must be chosen according to reason, that is, not attempting, save in the moral order, to accomplish results beyond our individual talents and capacities. We must nourish and strengthen the ideal by persistent thought of it, and persistent thought requires an act of the will, a combination which finds us in the harmonious employment of all our faculties toward a desired end. When this end or object is worthy and righteous, the powers of right are with the one who strives, and the efforts of men are fruitless to frustrate the work. In whatever line of creation is sought along, circumstances, health, mental virility, efficiency, or whatnot, concentration, faith, belief, realization, and mental discipline will be the factors that are indispensable. Everywhere in nature, concentration and crystallization are necessary to the formation of matter in its various forms. It would be almost impossible for water to become ice, or water to become ice if it were kept in constant motion. If one could see the activities of the mind rushing and whirling about first in one direction and then in another, they would gain some idea of the steadying effect of mental discipline. Concentration is like the provision of a channel to a quantity of water which is running over here and over there in 20 different directions, wasting, having no effect, but the placing of a deep channel would attract all the water and its force would be sufficient, be sufficient to drive a mill. Personal power is the desideratum of most people, for without it little headway in any direction can be made. He who would possess it must concentrate on it. Though to possess it means that preparation for it should be made. No force is worth anything unless it's understood. A check for a thousand dollars would be useless to a South Sea Islander or a native in the heart of a desert. So an influx of power would be out of place where a man had not learned the use of that power, where he had not created beforehand in himself some purpose to which power could be put when it was there. Let character come first in all self-development. And there is no better way of employing concentration than by applying it to this end, by building day by day a strong, evenly balanced character. All development afterwards will be sane. Whatever virtue a man would possess, let him dwell on it in thought, meditating, so to speak, not in the morbid sense of the word, but seeing and realizing himself as already the possessor of it, as he indeed is in his innermost center. And the longer he keeps this thought and belief before him, the more indissolubly will it weave itself into his being until he is that virtue personified. With a strong character gained by will culture, scientific concentration, and mental discipline, personal power is assured. 
and living on the superior side of life, on the highest side of the soul, as taught herein, the student gradually develops a power of mind that will enable him to cope with the vicissitudes of life. If to know one's self is one of the most important things a man can do, there is nothing which will so help him as this practice of concentrating on those things one would have knowledge on. And after knowledge comes wisdom, before which all else pales, pales into nothingness. The training of the, of, of the mind requires, first, a vigilant surveillance of thought in order to discover our feelings in this regard. Second, concentration upon what is good, useful, and true. And lastly, a directing of thought to the accomplishment of that which we desire. Courage of the student to face the truth about himself and the will to persevere in the work of reform in his world of thought lead unquestionably to peace, to mental strength, and to the adjusting of his life to conditions however difficult the conditions may be. This is the secret of true content the content the world is unconsciously seeking. Even when pursuing pleasure and vain gratifications that ever elude its grasp, or, when attained, are found to be dead sea fruit.